Kathy Thornton continues to ignite fuels that are have been deployed onto a thin fiber. Cut the latch to low shape. That's affirmative, Val. This is a real nice drop, and we'd like to continue on at step delta decimal five. Copy that. Once again, we are able to see experiment video from three of the experiments that are being processed on board Space Lab. And by Rommel and Kathy, can you confirm it's still burning? It just extinguished, and there's a little bit of clouding in the chamber this time. That was really strange looking. In Space Lab Huntsville for Kathy, uh, we are going to run with the FSDC fan on for this next three millimeter run. And when you're ready to copy the setting, I've got that for you. Kathy Thornton has just released another drop of fuel onto the fiber. And the fuel has just been ignited. You can see the combustion products or soot that are being released by the burning fuel. This the third front coming out from it, and now I'm getting a lot of the, the vapor at the end, the combustion products. Hello, Worcester, Mass. My name is Al Sacco, and I'm from Worcester, Mass. I'm a PS on this flight, United States Microgravity Lab number two. We're doing a lot of science experiments on a whole variety of different fields, biotechnology, material science, crystal growth, fluid dynamics, fluid physics, and combustion. And we're going to talk a little bit about all of these things with you guys today. But before we do, let me introduce, or let them introduce themselves, the Redshift. First, we'll go to our commander, the boss. Hi, I'm Ken Bowersox. I'm from Bedford, Indiana, and I'm the mission commander on SPS-73. I'm Kathy Thornton. I'm the payload commander on this flight. And I'm Ken Romier from Del Norte, Colorado, and I'm the pilot on this flight. And that's the red ship. Can we have the first question, please? Okay, for questions regarding fluid experiments, Worcester South High, please go ahead. This is Hosein Argus Asham, and my question is, what is the purpose of the contact angle experiment? Well, in order to understand the purpose of the contact angle experiment, you first have to understand two variables that are involved with it. One is called surface tension, and the other is contact angle, and they're related. Surface tension really can be simply thought of as how molecules like each other. If they like each other a lot, they have a very high surface tension. On the other hand, what you also have to balance is how they like the materials they contact. And those are called adhesive forces. Adhesive forces are how the liquids like the solid. So what you have when the contact angle experiment is a balance between what they call cohesive forces, or surface tension, and adhesive forces, so how it likes the wall. And when those two balance, and they're balanced by gravity, that's really how far up the liquid goes. Now in, in space, the reason we come to space to study surface tension is primarily because it dominates. And let me give you an example of that. See, in space, the orange juice, the molecules like each other, and they form a sphere. If you were to do that in, on the ground, of course, it would 
cling to the sides of the vessel. And these are called, again, surface tension is something called a cohesive force. Stephen Bellock from the Accelerated Learning Laboratory. Hi, I'm Nick Paquette from North High School. Hi, I'm Beth Quintadamo from North High School. Hi, I'm Bridget Hill from North High School. Hi, I'm Josh Norber from Doherty High School. Hi, I'm Tanisha Wester from North High School, and our question is, how does the surface tension and contact angle react in space when slope is added, and why? Slope is a what we call a surfactant, and what that does is reduce the surface tension. And in space, it reduces the surface tension by the same amount. It doesn't change at all in space. So again, what you can see is you can see the effect of that surfactant a lot more in space because you have a one-sixth gravity component, and therefore surface tension dominates over gravity, and we can explore that. But it really doesn't change anything more than it does on the ground. The ground and space are very similar when you add soap as a surfactant. Hi, I'm Katie Elworthy from Doherty. Another question, please. Hi, I'm Igor Gurevich from Doherty High School. And I'm Tom Devine from Doherty High. And our question is, in the contact angle experiment, what would happen if the slides were of different materials and sizes, and would other liquids change the results? Well, I hope, uh, with what I've explained to you so far, that surface tension and contact angle are basic properties of a liquid and its interaction with the solid. So those aren't affected by space. However, every time you change the liquid or you change the solid that it's in contact with, that is the material, then you, in fact, will affect the contact angle experiment, how high it rises. But the size, that is the size of the materials, or even the, the amount of liquid that you put in, really doesn't have a major effect on that, either in space or on the ground. Next question, please. We have five minutes remaining in Worcester. Please go ahead with the next question. Hi, my name is Hong Tran from North High, and I was wondering if the mass of an object can break its surface tension. You know, that's, that's another very interesting question, and you've got to think about it a little bit. Surface tension, again, is a basic property of a fluid, and it really doesn't change whether we have, whether we have a large mass on it or a small mass on it. The surface tension is the same. However, what you see is if I look at an eyedropper and I squeeze out a little bit of liquid on the ground, as that liquid grows, it gets very heavy, and as it gets heavy, it elongates the drop, and eventually it falls off. Now, the surface tension surface tension of that material didn't change. It just became so heavy that the adhesive forces were overcome by the cohesive forces. Excuse me, the cohesive forces were overcome. Or the cohesive and adhesive forces were overcome by gravity is what I'm trying to say. But up here, up here, that wouldn't happen, of course, and you saw that with the straw. When I squeezed out the orange juice, it just sort of hung there as a sphere. So surface tension really doesn't change. It's not broken by mass. But you see, it looks that way, and it seems that way, uh, because of your observation in the one-gravity environment. Hi, my name is Yola Stefani from South High. My question is, is there a difference in velocity of the spreading pepper in space? Well, to be honest with you, we didn't spread any pepper in space on this flight. At least we haven't yet. Uh, but. I would expect that there may be a difference in, in velocity, and the difference in velocity wouldn't be because of the surface tension effect, but be, be because of convective effects, temperature differences. And that's additive, so you get not only the surface tension effect, but in addition to that, you may get some convective effect. So you'd probably see a difference in the velocity of the pepper itself moving across the surface. Can I have another question, please? We have one minute left in Worcester. Time for one last question. For every action, there's a reaction. Would a ball of water disperse if you put pepper into it? Well, we haven't run that experiment either, but I can tell you the answer to that. Just like sprinkling uh, pepper on a, a liquid surface, what you'd see up here is you'd see the pepper just form around the outside of the sphere of liquid. And it, for every action, there is a reaction. As the pepper touched the surface of the liquid, the liquid would touch back with exactly the same force. But what you'd see is because of surface tension, that pepper would just adhere to the outside of the drop, and it would form all the way around the drop. You'd see a uniform distribution of pepper all the way around the drop.
Hi, my name is Kubali Chakraborty, and can fiber-supported drop combustion be used in the shuttle's engines to make maneuvering simpler, and are there any real-life applications? Yeah, that's a good question, too, and I have an aviator, aviator here and a, a fighter pilot that's going to answer that for us, and also the pilot of the shuttle, and this is Kent. Thanks, Sally. That's a great question, and the answer is maybe that can help us maneuver the shuttle. The, uh, and also, in real line applications, there are many. I'll start out by saying, as well as the shuttle from having better combustion, and the F-14 I used to fly, as well as the car that people drive, even the heater and water heater in your home, it can help them be much more efficient. And the reason we study that up here in microgravity is without the influence of gravity and without convection, the burning is much more even in a sphere, and it burns more slowly so we can control it and much better analyze it and hopefully come up with more efficient combustion processes and fuels. And additionally, that would also result in less pollutants, so it would help the environment also. Next question. Hello, my name is Jill Fackler. Um, do different flammable liquids form different shapes when they burn, and are the materials you're using different from ours? That's a good question. As I understand, the materials that you are using are uh, petroleum distillate, which is a mixture of all different kinds of petroleum products. We're trying some pure fuels up here, or very simple mixtures. We're using some methanol and water and a few other mixtures, and because they are liquids, they form a sphere here in space, uh, just like the orange juice you saw floating around. But we don't want these burning droplets floating around the space lab, so we can find them by putting them on a fiber. So they are spherical drops on a fiber. Um, the different materials all form the same shape. However, the, the um, combustion of the different materials is significantly different. The methanol was burning with a very, very faint blue shell of flame, and some of the other products were burning with yellow or several or blue and yellow alternating kind of flames. You have another question? Yes, my name is Jessica Huddy. Did your flames move around or vary in size and shape due to air currents? And do the flames produce any visible products such as smoke? That's a very good question. That's some of the things that we're trying to explore up here. We have done some of the burns without air currents, and we get a completely spherical shell of flame. And others we have done with air currents, and we get a teardrop shape where the, the uh, combustion products and the, the vapors that are burning are moving along with the air currents. It also changes the color of the flame because with air currents, we're feeding more oxygen to the, to the uh, ball of fire. And, uh, other, and when we're not having airflow, it's, uh, the oxygen has to diffuse into the combustion zone, so it's a little bit slower burning process. It also burns bluer, whereas we have airflow, we have a little bit of a yellow color. My name is Ray Marquette. What percentage of times did you get a good flame, and how long, on average, did your flames last? We've had a little bit of trouble getting the droplets deployed on the fiber, but once we get them on the fiber, uh, we get ignition every time. And uh, we, it burns from uh, on the average of five or six seconds for a small drop to a five millimeter drop that's going as long as 25 or 30 seconds, which is a lot longer burn time than you're getting on the ground with your experiment. Hi, my name is Geraldine Waters. And my question is, do you think anything besides the difference in gravity could cause the flames to differ? Gravity has a lot of effects on, the, on this experiment and yours. In your experiment, you're burning a teardrop-shaped fuel because gravity is pulling it down. Here we start out with a spherical drop of fuel. And also, because of convection, which is another effect of gravity, the combustion products and actually the vapors that are burning are rising in your experiment, and oxygen continues to be supplied from the bottom. Here we don't have that. So we're looking at diffusion of oxygen into the flame front to continue to feed it, which uh, is a little bit different than what you're doing. So gravity is certainly the major effect up here. And the lack of gravity is the difference in what we're doing and what you're doing down there. My name is Jared Shooter. Uh, do you have to replace the filament after each time that you burn the fluid? Yeah, 
Yeah, another good question. That's uh, We didn't replace the filament every time, but we do replace it periodically. And one of the reasons for that is we get soot deposits. We get carbon deposits, high molecular weight carbon materials. And what do they do? They change the surface tension of the liquid and how it interacts with the solid itself. That can result in a variety of different things, not the least of which is the drop moving along the filament itself. In addition to that, it can change the heat transfer rate, how heat is leaving the filament, which affects the studies that we're looking at. So we don't replace it all the time, but if it looks like it's getting a little sooty, then we do, in fact, replace it. My name is Kate Gayhart. Does the type of filament have an effect on the result of the experiment? Yeah, very much, and that's another uh, very interesting question. Because one of the things that we're looking at is, is all the different heat transfer and mass transfer effects, how oxygen comes into the flame, and that light blue flame that we see is a result of what we call a diffusive flame. Oxygen is not convecting in, it's not being brought in by other molecules as a group, but coming in individually, it's a diffusive flame. How the heat is taken out of the filament is very important because some of the heat is being conducted down the filament. So if we change that material, we can change it from a metal, which is very conductive, to a ceramic, which we're using up here, which is a little bit less conductive, and that changes the entire burning rate of the, the film, of the flame, excuse me, and changes what we see in the dynamics of the flame itself. So the material, the thickness of that material, are very, very important. It's also important in, in microgravity to make sure, again, the liquid and the solid are compatible in the sense that the liquid, to a certain extent, but not too much, wets the solid. In other words, we don't want it to like the solid too much, so it won't maintain its sphericity, but will spread along the filament. But we do want it to maintain its contact with the filament. It needs to like the filament a little bit. Hello, my name is Ann Johnsey. My question is, is the flame isolated to the coil of the filament or does it move away from the filament so just the fluid is burning? First, again, we're not using a coil up here. We're using a uh, filament, just a straight line of material, straight string. But you should you probably remember from studying this that, in fact, the liquid is not burning, but the vapors from the liquid are burning. And that's what we see as well. We see a shallow or a halo of burning material that's displaced slightly from the liquid or the fuel. And that's what burns, the vapor. Next question, please. And this is the last question from Louisville Science Center. Please go ahead. My name is Tom Folda, and I was wondering, would the amount of electricity used in the experiment change the rate of combustion? And would re microgravity have any effect on this? That's another uh, interesting question. We have to think on that a little bit. But certainly when you put in more electricity into your filaments, now we're not doing it exactly that way. We're, we're uh, igniting it from an external source. We're not putting electricity through it. I wouldn't expect the electricity to be affected by the microgravity al at all, but by increasing the electricity in the filament, if we were doing it that way, like you're doing it on the ground, increases the rate at which the filament heats and therefore impacts the rate at which the vapors combust. So in fact, as you change the electricity, you may see an effect, but that would be again a function of the material that you make your, your coil out of and the rate at which you put electricity in. It would be a very subtle and difficult thing to measure for you, but it is measurable on the ground. In microgravity, that wouldn't affect us very much, first of all, but because of the way we're doing the experiment. But in addition to that, even if we were using an electrical way to heat the, the filament, I wouldn't expect uh, microgravity to affect electricity very much up here. So that, in and of itself, would not be affected by microgravity. The same thing that was affected on the ground, though, would be affected up here in the sense that the rate at which you put the electricity in, how much the thickness of the material, and what that material it is, how much of a conductor it is, will, in fact, affect that burning rate.